Eddie Chavez. Ruben Nava. And Jesse Romero. Jesus 911. Jesus 911 on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. I'm, my name is Ruben Nava. My partner, Jess Romero. We are a two man car, a two man hoop, and we are 10 8. We're going to bring you some Catholic intel, some briefing to uh, get you uh, fired up for today so you can go out and evangelize. We have a good show today. Good morning, right. Jess. Good morning, reporting for duty, sir. Ruben, that's what it's all about. We're not going to be here that long on planet Earth. That's right. And the goal of planet Earth is, is the goal of the Catholic is to get to heaven. And so everything that we share with you on the program, it's, it, there's a twofold purpose. As Catholics, we're called to evangelize. That means announce the good news about Jesus Christ and salvation. And the second part is also that's incumbent upon the baptized is to denounce error or slay error or expose darkness, as St. Paul says in the Bible. So that's what we do on this show. We expose darkness to the light of the gospel, but we also give you the good news. Ruben, we want to talk about two incredible uh, attacks on Catholic priests, one physical and one verbal. Uh, can you introduce these topics? <laughs> yeah, um, Montreal, Canada, at the uh, uh, the famous... St. Joseph Oratory, and uh, that's where, where the uh, St. Brother Andre was, uh, worked day and night tirelessly promoting St. Joseph and devotion to St. Joseph. And um, a 26-year-old man has been charged with an attempted murder and the stabbing of a Catholic priest morning mass at Montreal's St. Joseph Oratory last week. And so um, he just came up from out of the, uh, out of the, uh, from the crowd, and you know he was in, in the pews, his name was Vlad Christian Arema. Um, he came up and attacked the priest uh, as he was about to uh, preach the gospel. And uh, the priest tried to move away from him, but uh, knocked him down. And the, um, the attacker stabbed him, and the knife broke off. Um, and so it was, it, you could look at it as Luckily a Luckily it was a cheap knife. Yeah, it must have been a cheap knife. But uh, uh, then the people in the... In the in the at mass, they detained him. Um, he didn't seem to. He didn't put up a fight. The the suspect was a big tall guy, and he could have he could have easily gotten away. And um, uh, there's no, the police are not giving out the details of the motive for the attack. And uh, I I don't want to rush to judgment because I, I don't know his background. I, I try to look it up. Um, yeah, there's very little said about him that he's yeah. just from Romanian descent. Yeah. He was uh, apparently does he's unemployed. He's, he filed bankruptcy, so financially he's not in a good situation. He's also uh, I think been arrested back in 2017 for criminal harassment. Uh, so he, it's not like he's got a, a, a huge record. But again, I don't know if there was any political or religious reasons why he would do this. I guess only time will tell. Yeah. And, you know, so I, I, I don't know if uh, some people are speculating, you know, because they found a uh, from his Twitter page, he had a symbol, uh, this A-N-K-H, I don't know how you pronounce that, Ankh, symbol of life in, in ancient Egypt. He's got a picture of that with protective wings of Isis uh, coming out of it. And um, it's the Romanian flag in the top left corner. And um, so we don't know. Um, what his motive. Uh, Ruben, I'll, t I'll be honest with you. Uh, my, my lower nature kicks in here. I watched the video. Yeah. If, 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 if somebody would ever attempt that in my presence to, in a Catholic priest, that would be the last time they would attempt that. I'm telling you right now. I looked at that video and I'm saying, where are the men? Yeah. They, this guy should have been, they should have pounced on him. They, they, they should have, it should have been a dog pile of 12 men on top of him. And this guy... Uh, yeah, yes, um, this, this guy should have got the message that you never walk into a Catholic church and ever try something like this again. Yeah. Like, it, I just asked myself, where are the men? And I'm not saying to kill the guy. That's not what I'm saying. But boy, oh boy, do you, do you give this guy, I mean, take him down hard and fast. So he knows, man, this was a stupid thing for me to do. I'll never do this again. Yeah. 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 He would have been bringing a, a knife to a gunfight, Jess. You know, uh, he was, yeah. uh, he, it, it, 
it it reminded me of that attack on the subway where that uh, one guy is kicking a lady in the head, that, and these guys sitting around uh, videotaping it instead of stopping the guy. You know, so yeah. But but you know this this isn't uh, the first attack. You know, if it turns out this this individual is a Muslim, uh, I mean, he has the the appearances with the the beard, no mustache. Um, but again, I I don't want to judge him. Um, so we know for sure, but boy, oh boy, yeah. it, sm- it smells, uh, there's something fishy about this uh, yeah. attack. But, but, uh, I, I try to look up some of the attacks in recent years on Catholic priests and uh, not to mention just civilians. I mean, you, you know, in, in Egypt, we had, uh, three busloads of, of Coptic Christians that were attacked and, and killed, um, along the road as they traveled three busloads. Um, but I, I'm finding attacks Two Islamist terrorists attacked a, a mass at Catholic Church in Saint uh, in Normandy, July of 2016. In, 20, in December of 2018, lives of 19 religious men and women martyred during the Algerian Civil War. Uh, June June 3rd, 2010, in Turkey, uh, a Roman Catholic bishop was stabbed to death in eastern Turkey. May 4, 2018, militants killed a Roman Catholic priest in Bangui. Um, yeah, that, uh, there's also July in July of 2018, you had, uh, uh, a vicar general of Bombari diocese. Which, um, he says that he was killed by a suspected Muslim rebel group. Uh, you had that in the Philippines in June of 2018, three Catholic priests killed one severely injured in separate attacks in the country since December by Muslims? Muslims. These are all Muslims. These are all Muslims. All attacks. Muslims. Okay. Eight, I know there were, yeah. uh, Ruben, you got one there about a Catholic priest in Mexico last year? Yeah. Well, that, I didn't I didn't associate that with the Muslims. I saw that there were Catholic priests that were killed in Mexico, but... Uh, no, no. There, there was one it was a Catholic Muslim? priest in Mexico oh, I didn't even during know. Mass at the cathedral. It was a Muslim. Wow. He was yelling Allah Akbar and went and uh, 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 stabbed him in the neck. Yeah. So what... what in yeah, Nigeria? I mean, Ruben, this, yeah. this is not outside of the ordinary is what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, and you know this doesn't get a lot of a lot of uh, news attention on the mainstream media. You just don't. Yeah, because uh, they don't care. It's a Catholic priest, right? But the Muslim uh, got you know it was it was a terrorist a terrible attack when the uh, that individual I think it was what New Zealand where he went in he he shot up a mosque uh, that was tragic, but that uh, the the attention that it got you know it doubled in comparison to what we see. Well, a anything lot of Catholic, else? Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, and the other thing that's going on, too. In I'm France, surprised they didn't say this white guy that did the shooting was a Christian. That's that's all they needed to say. I know. You know? Yeah. And, you know, in in France, you heard that there's uh, 10 Catholic churches attacked in one week this week, this month. Ten, by Muslims? By Muslims. Yes. They're 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 t- they're tearing down. Hey, Ruben, this stuff doesn't, it doesn't even make the news no. anymore. This happens so often. This is not even newsworthy any longer. Right. So they're de- they're de- desecrating uh, tabernacles and altars and statues and you know so God help us man yeah yeah we um again this go- kind of goes back to a lot of the um the immigration issues right I mean it all goes hand in hand and yeah when hand you hand. when you allow people into your country that don't share your you know the country's values which most of the countries at least at least in their tradition were Judeo Christian values. And uh, they completely, Sharia law is completely incompatible with Judeo-Christianity, and it's compatible, I- incompatible with the, our Constitution. Right. And yet, uh, you got liberals in this country that they want to just uh, bring them in by, by, you know, by the boatload. Yeah. And, and uh, this is what you get. You get a clash of civilizations. You get one civilization that's promoting Sharia law, Islamic Sharia law, and another civilization that's kind of like secular humanist at this point, and uh, they, the Muslims see how secular humanism, it breeds a weak society. It breeds weak men. It breeds weak politicians. So they said, man, these guys are ripe for the taking. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And hey, yeah. Ruben, let's go on to uh, another topic on another Catholic priest. Father Michael Rodriguez from El Paso, Texas. What Great priest. He was yeah. attacked by Beto O'Rourke, this guy that's running for president. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? Well, this is when Beto was part of uh, the city council in, uh, in El Paso, Texas. And this video, uh, uh, pro-abortion congressman Beto, Beto O'Rourke, who, like you said, is running for president, it shows him berating a Catholic priest for defending male-female marriage at an El Paso city council meeting in 2011. This just shows you uh, what kind of a, a, a man that uh, 
that you're, that's going to be running for president. The incident took place in June of 2011 when El Paso priest Father Michael Rodriguez, a great uh, pr- priest, a traditional priest, spoke against extending marriage benefits to same-sex couples. During the public's uh, comment part of the meeting, O'Rourke, who had been serving as the city council since 2005, 2005, called Father Rodriguez back to the podium after his remarks, seemingly to do nothing more than lecture him so as to score. Yeah, he wanted to embarrass points. them in front of the whole yeah. city council. You could tell that was his point. He wanted to embarrass a Catholic priest by talking down to him. Right. And he, he admits he was, a, he was baptized, raised Catholic, this guy, O'Rourke. Another apostate. Claimed he had an obligation to point out the moral failings of the Catholic Church, especially on child abuse, and that luckily he doesn't need Father Rodriguez's approval to vote how he sees fit. I want you to know why this, for you, has become... He wanted to ask Father why this was the burning issue of the day. And we'll put it on the second yeah. segment so you can hear O'Rourke in his own words. In the second segment, we'll put it on. But but uh, Father Rodriguez, uh, this guy has a lot of videos on YouTube. I watch him all the time. Right. Yeah, he was trained at the north uh at the pontifical north american college in rome and uh he's an el paso priest and he's embraced the latin mass and as a result of that i mean he was he was loved out over in el paso by the yeah. bishops and everybody he was part of the di- uh you know vo- he was a vocation director but as soon as he started having a preference for the latin mass boy oh boy he lost favor with everybody there and after he spoke out at this council meeting they moved him after this council meeting. So we'll, we'll pick up on the other side of the break. If you have any comments or questions, dial 888-526-2151. You're listening to Jesus 911. This is Terry Barber inviting you, all the men, to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. We count on your spiritual and financial support because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. We are back. Soul Patrol. Soul Patrol, two-man car, LASD, leaving all sin destroyed. Two former retired LASD deputy sheriffs, and we are bringing you the good news of the day and uh, bringing you some Catholic briefing. 
Jesse, go ahead and finish. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, uh, Mr. Engineer, can you put on Beto O'Rourke uh, trying to berate Father Rodriguez? I want people to hear the Democrats' poster child as he, as, as, uh, he, supposedly he was born and raised Catholic as he tries to disrespect a Catholic priest. This is what the Democrat Party thinks of Catholicism in general. Can you play the clip? I'm sorry, uh, Father Rodriguez, if, if, I may, if I may ask you a question at, at the podium. Um, and I apologize. I, I was hoping to be recognized earlier so you didn't have to, to take the time to sit down. Um, a couple of things. Um, one, is, as should be abundantly clear to everyone, uh, no church or creed, uh, religion or faith uh, will govern the actions of city government. And, and the two are uh, separated, I think, for, for good reason and good cause uh, in this community. But as, but as someone who was baptized uh, and, and raised in, in the Catholic faith, um, I, I do feel an obligation to point out um, some of the moral failings uh, of the church that you represent, especially as you try to take the moral high ground in, in, this, in this debate. And I think fair is fair, folks. So luckily, I don't need your approval to move forward. I, I want to know why this, for you, has become the burning issue of its day and how you can stand here with a straight face and say that this is, this is a priority for the church. When, when, and I can think of two obvious uh, cases where the church has failed on a global level. Uh, for one, I, I know in the very recent past, the Pope, our current Pope, was in Africa telling the people in that country who are suffering a holocaust of HIV and AIDS infection not to use condoms. I can think of another very significant and serious problem within the Catholic Church, which is the uh, proven widespread abuse of children within the care of the Catholic Church. I wonder where your outspokenness is on those issues when all we're trying to do at the city is to treat all of our employees equally, to offer health insurance for people who might need health coverage. And folks, that means medicine. That means treating diseases. That means helping people in need. What, what could be more within the, teaches, within the church's teachings than that? So, so how do you reconcile that? Um, I would make a few comments. The first one I would make is that I want this also to be public so that the public also know. Last week, I know it was short notice. I don't know if, I don't know if Mayor could give you out of town or what the situation was, but last week I sent an email to the mayor and all the city reps basically just pleading with him, saying, look, let's just sit down and talk about the issue, you know, in a mutual, respectful way, you know, in a rational way. We can hash out all these issues because I think, I think the representative uh, O'Rourke brings up good questions. And, I mean, I'd be more than happy to address them at length. I think we need more time, though. And that's actually one reason why I'm asking any city council member that if they're planning on voting for this, to abstain so we can discuss it more at length. I do want to thank Re City Representative Byrd because she's the only one. She's the only one out of the mayor and all the other city reps that actually responded to my email. And she invited me to speak with her. So, I, I mean, I will say publicly also, I respect her for that and I thank her for that. Now, I, I also understand, don't think I'm making judgments. I know that some of the city reps maybe, you know, you didn't get the email or you didn't read it or you maybe didn't trust me or whatever it might be. So. I do want to make it public, though, that I'd be more than willing to address any issue with city council, even if it doesn't have to do with this, questions about the Catholic Church, more than willing to do it. The one comment I would just make with regard to that, um, uh, City Rep. O'Rourke, would be that, unfortunately, um, within the Catholic Church, you have the human element. Um, you're also seeing this human element because you're seeing even churchmen in our own diocese dissenting from church teaching. But... The point is, is that all the failures of the Catholic Church, and there are any number, are because members, even in the hierarchy, are not being faithful to Catholic Church teaching. You'll never, and this is why I ask every, you'll never find a society that is being faithful to what the Church teaches that is not flourishing. And so, yes, I mean, you do have priests, you have Catholic priests that haven't been faithful to their promise of celibacy. They haven't been faithful to really serving God with all their heart and with all their strength. And, and, and it, can, it can really be damaging. But by the same token, that's why as, as, as Catholics and even all Catholics of El Paso, we have to trust in Holy Mother Church. We have to trust in the truth. 
love our brothers and sisters regardless of sexual orientation, but oppose ourselves to those actions, and you always have to make that distinction Thanks. between Thank you person for and responding action. to Mr. O'Rourke's question. Okay, wow, what an amazing Catholic priest. You know, Ruben, yeah. I, I, can you imagine? He spoke like this at a secular city council meeting. He spoke, this is called full contact Catholicism. He put it out there. I mean, they were probably looking and rolling their, their eyes and stuff and, and uh, you know, probably tapping their feet on the ground. But this guy spoke the truth of the Catholic faith to power. And he was punished for this, apparently, by uh, the, the former bishop that was there of El Paso. I guess he was removed. He was um, removed. Well, yeah. yeah af after that, uh, after basically standing. And he was very respectful. Yes. Uh, and, and here's what Beto O'Rourke, the Democrats' uh, darling, this is what he tried to do. Okay? Because El Paso City Council, once again, like, like all the Democrats in, in politics, are always trying to insert themselves into morality. They, they, they want to uh, pass, uh, they, they want to recognize same sex unions over in El Paso. And all he's doing, most of the people in El Paso are Catholic. Yes. So this guy, this priest, is an authentic Catholic spokesman for all the Catholics out there under Beto O'Rourke and under this El Paso City Council. He espoused the absolute truth of what the church teaches. You know, Ruben, it would have been beautiful. It would have been 10,000 lay Catholics from El Paso right outside the doors of City Hall to show him that he wasn't alone. But uh, I think uh, the City Council people figured this is a lone priest. He doesn't even have the backing from his bishop. I don't see any lay Catholics out there uh, and, 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 any, and, and any mob out there. So uh, we'll just kind of just berate him and insult him and dismiss him. Well, he, um, when he gave his first five-minute uh, opening, he was applauded, loud, round, a rounding applause by whoever was the, the people that were in the chamber. There. Okay, so there, so there was, were people in the chamber. Yeah, with there were. <clears throat> so they, they gave him a, a rounding applause. And then you could hear when O'Rourke was... And I'm basing him. A few people clapped when he spoke about the the, the priestly scandal, and so. Um, but he came back with grace. Father Rodriguez came in, and, and yeah. this is you know he's been trained at the highest institutes. He's got uh, completed his theological theological studies at the Pontifical Gregorian Institute in Rome. I mean, this is no slouch. And um, like you said, this is a Catholic community, Jess, and he and he spoke with clarity, and he spoke with charity, and. Uh, you know, we don't sure did. Yeah, we do not. Um, we don't we don't judge their their these people's hearts, but we we have to give them what the, the you know, the gospel teaches, you know, what Jesus Christ taught them, lest they 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 die in their in their folly, in their sin. So God bless this man. And uh he, he went on, like you said, he got he got transferred out of there by his bishop and because he's his, been persecuted ever since. Yeah, he started writing opinion pieces in the El, Ta El Paso Times. But this is what the bishops should be doing. This is what our 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 our, our bishops and cardinals should be doing. And, and uh, God bless him for what he, he... And he went off and he kept responding in June. And to, uh, so he, he goes off and he says, um, uh, Mr. O'Rourke was city representative, but he, he says that... His disgraceful response is incompatible not only with Catholicism, but also with basic respect for God, his law, Christian morality, and the truth. <laughs> he, and he doesn't know if O'Rourke is a practicing Catholic, but he... I'm sure he's not. Yeah, yeah, he, you can't be. You know, you can't be the deep in sin. Uh, we have people in the houses of Congress that, you know, claim like Pelosi and um, others that they claim to be Catholic, and they, they don't know the first thing about Catholicism, yet they try to speak for it. He says, I, I hope more Catholics begin to realize that at present we are living in the midst of some of the most terrible crises in the entire history of the Catholic Church. It is a moral crisis. It's a doctrinal crisis. It's a liturgical crisis. The vast majority of Catholics, including the hierarchy, have lost the faith. Mm -hmm. We must beg God for the grace to recover our precious Catholic faith, which includes the traditional Latin Mass, relativism, modernism, Protestantism, Freemasonry, and secular neo-paganism co have corrupted and nearly destroyed the one true Catholic faith. He says, one obvious sign of this massive corruption of the faith is the shocking number of so-called Catholic politicians who support the heinous sins of abortion and homosexual activity and the accompanying silence on the part of our bishops. 
Every single Catholic has the grave moral obligation, that's you and I, Jess, that's all of us, to oppose the heinous sins of abortion and homosexual activity, both in the private and public spheres. You want to pick it up from there? Yeah, he says, this is Father Rodriguez from Diocese of El Paso. He says, it is impossible to be a true Catholic while at the same time supporting these intrinsic evils, abortion and homosexuality. Every single Catholic bishop has the grave moral obligation to teach, promote, and defend these infallible moral truths, whatever the cost. Failure to do so is a betrayal of Christ. And right now, by the way, here's my comment. Many bishops and cardinals are betraying Jesus' present moment right now. Yes. This is another Arian crisis. He, he says, if a Catholic politician remains obstinate in his or her public sins, for example, the support of abortion or same-sex marriage, it is without question the duty of the Catholic bishop to issue a decree of excommunication for the good of the individual soul, the good of the church as a whole, and infidelity to the church. <clears throat> Where is the Catholic bishop who's truly standing up for Christ and the truth? Where is the Catholic bishop who's truly protecting his flock from the heretical wolves? My dear children, for those who truly know and love the faith, it's fairly obvious that Judas Iscariot is alive and well in today's episcopate. That means bishops, and I agree with him. And let me tell you, uh, today what we're seeing right now in the Catholic faith, here's where I believe the silence comes Here's, I'm going to connect the pieces for you. The Catholic bishops run Catholic relief services, Catholic charities, and all these uh, Catholic social justice programs. They receive from 80 to $90 million from the federal government for their pet projects, for their social justice pro projects. Well, guess what? I have no doubt, I haven't been to these meetings, but I have no doubt I can hear the conversation from Democrat politicians that sign off on this money, I can hear them say, okay, bishops, we will fund your Catholic relief services and Catholic charities to the tune of $90 million. You want this money? Yes, yes, we want the money. Yeah, okay, no problem. Just remember, get all your priests in your deanery meetings and tell them to stop talking about abortion, same-sex marriage, euthanasia, and have them talk about the poor. Have them talk about immigration. Have them talk about not building a wall. Ruben, here's what's happening. I'm not stupid. This is very easy to figure out from piecing the stuff together. The message of the Catholic bishops is by and large being controlled by the U.S., uh, by, the, by the Democrat Party. How? Because it's tied into money. If somebody's going to drop $90 million into your bank account, do you think you're not going to modify your message to be to conform with those that are giving you this type of money? It's, it's simple. True. It's right. very simple. Follow the money. And uh, follow us on the second half of the show. We'll be right back. We're going to be talking about a, a great article coming up. The Trojan Horse in the City of God. This is Terry Barber inviting you all the men to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877 526 2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877 526 2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. We count on your spiritual and financial support because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show, and they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Two man car on Soul Patrol, Jesus 911. John 316, our call letters. That's right. Hey, call dispatch if you have any questions. 888-526-2151. Ruben, there's there's the greatest book that we've never read out there. It's called The Trojan Horse in the City of God. Ruben, you're holding it up right there. Yeah. I've uh, I've got that book in my shelf as well. I haven't read it. I, I kind of know the contents of it, uh, you know, from reading periodicals and reviews on it. Now we got an article on it, so I'm going to be motivated to read the article, uh, the book as well. Yeah. So the book talks about, Ruben, there's a famous battle. It's, uh, it's, it's known as Homer's Epic, the Iliad. So this is a story of war that was waged by Greece against the city of Troy. Now, the Greeks, they were unable to, def- to defeat the Trojans on the battlefield. So the, Cre- the, the Greeks came up with a strategy, with a ploy. Okay? They built a gigantic wooden horse, and they filled the horse with Greek soldiers. They left it on the beach, they boarded their ships, and they pretended like they went back home. So the th- Trojans thought, okay, all right, these guys are scared, we defeated them. Uh, but they left us a gift of tribute uh, for our courage. So they, they drug the great horse into the city of Troy, and all the citizens were admiring. Oh, wow, look at the gift that the Greeks gave us, man. They're afraid of us. Well, guess what? Apparently, the, the, the Trojans started partying and... Uh, Drinking and carousing stood up late. Half the city was drunk. So that night, the Greek ships, they came back very quietly. And the soldiers that were inside the belly of the horse, of this wooden horse, they descended to the ground from a, from a, small, uh, from a small opening on the bottom of the horse. And they opened the gates to the city as all the Greeks were asleep and drunk. And so uh, they opened the, the gates of the city and the Greek army that was outside, they came in and they assisted and they invaded the city and they slit their throats. They killed them in their sleep. They killed them as they were drunk. They destroyed the city of Troy. This story is partially explains, in good part of what I would say, in large part explains what's happened to the Catholic Church in the last hundred years. And this is where Diedrich von Hildebrand wrote the book that you just held up the Trojan horse in the city of God. He's basically saying that the modernists, the progressives, the liberals, the secular humanists, the communists, the masons, they have come into the Catholic church, uh, you know, in, in, in the cloak of darkness and they're here, Ruben, and they're slitting our throats. That's right. Yeah. He, this, uh, Dietrich von Hildebrand, a great theologian, um, in his own right. And, and, um, he, he was also a convert to the faith and he, he was uh, hated by um, Hitler and and his Nazi regime, and so he had to escape. He escaped uh, Nazi Germany, and, um, and then he it, uh, went to Aust- Austria. And eventually, when Germany took over there, he had to he had to flee again. And there he he came to the United States in 1940. But he's written over 30 books, and um, this is one of uh, one of his best for sure. And his his wife, Alice von von Hildebrand, she another also, scholar, another yeah. Well, she uh, she might be ninety five at, at this point. Yeah, she's yeah. in her nineties, still alive. Yeah, amazing. And so they uh, she they did some revisions to the book with her. Well, you know, with her, she she made the revisions, and uh, so the updated uh, version to kind of um, fill in what what has gone on since this book was written in nineteen sixty seven, right uh, after the council. So he was like a prophet, Jess, when he he was talking about things that we're seeing today that we didn't know much about back then. Mm. And it is amazing when you and the author of this article, he's he's a a scholar in his own right. Carl Sundell, 
he's a philosopher himself, an author, and and he does a, a very good uh, critique of this book, or and he analyzes this book, and he puts his own commentary on it. And it's 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 a fantastic article. So yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, Here's one of the lines I like. He says uh, the the article says John Cardinal O'Connor. He was the the Cardinal of New York, uh, who, yeah. probably 25 years ago. He wrote the forward on this. Yeah, he says in his introduction to the Trojan Horse remarked that the glorious achievements of Vatican II were undermined and sabotaged by those who sought to remake the church in her, in their own image. Right. Okay? So there's a lot of opinions on that. In other words, some people believe that will say, okay, the Vatican II documents were hijacked by the left. That's one school of thought. Other people will, 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 another school of thought, and these all have a lot of merit to them. Another one will say, no, uh, a lot of things in Vatican II were written sp- specifically or purposefully very ambiguous so they can be interpreted in an orthodox or in a progressive manner. That's another view. Uh, <clears throat> another view is uh, many of the Council of Fathers were progressive liberal modernists, and what they wanted to do, they, they just paid lip service to the teachings of the church, but they fully intended to, to move on roughshod with what's called the spirit of Vatican II, you know, knowing that most lay Catholics don't read the 16 documents. Most lay Catholics are just busy trying to make a living. And they would, they would interpret uh, the documents for us based on, uh, on their modernist progressive worldview. So nonetheless, Ruben, it's been a mess ever since. And Hildebrand, he makes clear by his thesis in this book, he says, he says, we shall try to shed some light on the confusions, the apostasies, the disclosures of the loss of faith that are to be found among those who trumpet forth the claim that they are now the true interpreters of the council. We shall try to examine all the horrible errors that are being propagated now by the so-called progressives. So he was right on point already back, uh, you know, he, I think he passed away, what, 30 years ago, something like that? 77, yeah. Okay. Well, more than that, yeah. Yeah. 40 years ago. Yeah. Um, um, certainly, uh, one of the prime objectives of Vatican II, the author says, was uh, was a renewal of the, the, the true spirit of the Christ in the church. In fact, the uh, the documents did achieve that end, but yet the, uh, the interpretations of those documents resulted in what Hildebrand calls the superficial insipid pronouncements of various theologians and laymen that have broken out everywhere like an infectious disease. That's what Jesse was talking about, the modernists, the you know, Freemasons, communists. Uh, what resulted from this, from this choice was the dividing Catholics into conservative and progressive camps. And, but Hildebrand notes that there could be no such thing as a progressive Catholic. Christ's teachings do not progress. They are eternally true and nothing can be done to improve them. Amen. Amen, huh? The third and only goal of the Vatican II that should have been made clear to everyone and chosen by everyone was the goal of being transformed by Christ, in Christ, by being faithful to the magisterium, that's the official teaching authority of the church, which conveys the will of Christ in the world. But to hear the progressives, it was the magisterium that needed to be transformed by certain theologians who supposed they knew better than the magisterium and how to transform it. So Vatican II was was called out not to improve the church by introducing elements that contradicted the past teachings, but to cleanse it of those wrongful elements that threatened to overcome the doctrines and spirit of Christ. And I'll add, it wasn't a doc, it wasn't a dogmatic council. It was a pastoral council. They even said it themselves. Right. They didn't define any new things. Go ahead, Jess. Yeah. And, and one of the things like, for example, to be on safe ground, when you read the new catechism, you could just look at the footnotes and you can see, for example, when you look at like Eucharistic theology, look at the footnotes, it quotes the Council of Trent, the Council of Florence. Then you can say, okay, well, this, it's reasserting dogmatic teachings of the church. Now, when you look at some of the other footnotes, like, for example, religious liberty, for example, and there are no footnotes, it just quotes, they just quote themselves. These are the opinions of the Council Fathers at the time of how we should, in the modern world, relate with those uh, with those people in terms of religious liberty. Mm-hmm. But we have to say that there is definitely a different view uh, with religious liberty in past with past popes or, or, in, or in past times of the Catholic Church. Correct. So there are some new teachings in the non 
in the non-doctrinal sections of Vatican II. There are new teachings. We have to admit that. They were never there before. And, uh, it, and I'm not saying that that uh, they can't do this. Hey, they're the Council of Fathers. They figured, okay, this is the modern world. This is how we're going to do it. But let's at least admit that this is a new teaching. And when you look at the footnotes, they don't quote any prior councils because there's no prior councils to quote. These are new key teachings that came up came up by some of some of those in the commission uh, at Vatican II. Specifically, you know, just one example would be religious liberty. Okay, mm -hmm. but but going back to uh, von Hildebrand's article is uh, I'll tell you, I think his his I, I want to go right to his his wife before I go continue with von Hildebrand himself because she puts she adds something to this book that wasn't there before. It's in the epilogue. Uh, Mrs. Von Hildebrand, she, she writes, in the Trojan horse in the city of God, it, it cannot be fully uh, appreciated and it deserves a thoughtful reading in its entirety, but there's one aspect of the Trojan horse that was not treated by Hildebrand and that was introduced by his wife recently, Alice, who's now 85. Here's what Alice adds to the book, which is something that we've been seeing more and more. In a short ex excerpt from an interview which can be viewed here, she's related how she and her husband discovered that there was a sinister plot by Joseph Stalin's communist regime in the 1920s to secretly infiltrate Catholic seminaries with superbly trained communist candidates for the priesthood. And at the age of 19, Joseph Stalin himself had been expelled from a Catholic seminary for being a Marxist. Never knew that. Yeah, so I knew he was a Catholic. I don't know he went to seminary, so that's new on me. But I knew I knew he was raised Catholic. So Alice von Hildebrand says perhaps he had a score to settle. Mm. And so the Hildebrands, they learned of the plot from Bella Dodd, an apostate Catholic who joined the communists in the 1920s and later returned to the Catholic Church. And she wrote a book called School of Darkness where she lays all this out. Well, Bella Dodd testified to the House of... On American Activities Committee in 1952, and she said, Bella Dodd, that during the 1930s and 40s, she had personally recruited well over a thousand seminarians who were without faith or morals, in other words, they were sexual degenerates, for the purpose of entering the priesthood to undermine the Catholic Church and turn it in a socialist direction. So by the time of Vatican II, these seminarians and any of the cohorts that, had, that, that they had acquired would have been in their 40s and 50s, and they would have well been able to undermine the council by preaching a leftist or progressive interpretation of his findings and by encouraging widespread doubts about Catholic orthodoxy. We'll be right back talking about the Trojan horse of the city of God. Don't change that dial. This is Terry Barber inviting you, all the men, to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. We count on your spiritual and financial support because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Jesus 911, where iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. And we're talking about the uh, article on the Trojan horse in the city of God. It was a book written by the great Dietrich von Hildebrand. And uh, we're going over it, and he's speaking about the, of the council and how pretty much how it was hijacked by the progressives. Um, he talks about um, yet another false reaction in the progressives to legalism is to assert that they so often do that love of neighbor is necessary to show our love of God. This is, of course, he says, the reverse of the right order of things. In order to love our neighbor truly, we must first love God. That's the first of the greatest commandment from Jesus himself. So the progressive stresses to a fault the obligation to prove love of neighbor, neighbor usually to the neglect of our need to love God first and above, and above all. And and Jess, you talked about that when on all the social programs. That's a perfect example. Oh, immigration. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, feeding the homeless, that, that's all great, but we have, to, uh, we have to love God first. So it says, um, as Hildebrand puts it, wrong as it is to restrict love exclusively to God and deny real love to one's neighbor, it is still much worse to exclude direct love of God. There are many Christi- Christians nowadays under the regime of the social justice guardians who are consumed with good works but have a bare acquaintance with prayer and meditation. And that liberation theology comes to my mind. Um, so... There are certain types of religious priests, nuns, have they've been infected with this progressive secularization of rightful authority in the church. The old vows of obedience voluntarily taken, now just voluntarily abandoned. Just as voluntarily abandoned. Supposedly, progressive pundits want to correct ecclesiastical authority by doing away with it altogether. And um, so, hence the invention of the priest union. They, they had a pre- I never knew about this. The priests set up a union in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Yeah, I didn't know that either. Yeah, and admittedly an extreme example, but that was supposed to mimic the settlement of disputes practiced in the secular profession. Hildebrand also complains of the progressive Catholics' demand that we not seek to evangelize those outside the faith. This is powerful right here. For for this amounts to an attempt to impose our faith on others. Progressive Hilde. Progressive, Hildebrand notes, consider this presumption intolerance, disrespect for the freedom of others, and triumphalism. They even go so far as to claim that we should learn about spiritual matters from atheists. Well, you know, you see that too in the secular world where Americans are saying, hey, you can't fly the American flag because that, of what it, what it stands for. It's, it, it's oppressed a lot of people. And, and so this is what what the Catholics are doing, they're they're not going out. The mission, the mission fields are are somewhat empty as opposed to you know what it was pre-Vatican too, Jess. This article, Ruben, is very good because it it it, it has several subjects. Yeah, where it ta- where Dieter von Hildebrand talks about, and the subjects. It's, it's a long article. You can get it from the website. Uh, go to a uh, virginmostpowerful.org uh, dot org or my website jesseromero dot com. It's called the Trojan Horse in the City of God by Carl Sundell. Uh, you can read the article. Uh, he talks about, Diedrich von Hildebrand talks about false renewal, number one. Uh, it's, it, it's, you know, you ask yourself, has our church uh, influenced the world after Vatican II, or has the world influenced the church after Vatican II? That's what you have to ask yourself. There's been a false renewal. There's been a concession on, on the church's part, our part. We've caved into the world, and we've got to go back to our roots uh, the second point part of the article talks about a false reaction. Ruben, you just shared about it, about this, this the invention of this priest union in the Archdiocese of L.A. And that's supposed to mimic the settlement of disputes practiced in secular professions. Uh, you know, again, Catholics submitting the religion to scientific examination. You also have, a, it's called Episcopal Tiptoe. What does that mean? Episcopal Tiptoe, it's, it's, it's 
the emasculation of the hierarchy, okay? Allowing the hierarchy to become effeminized. That's, that's another problem that we're dealing with. He talks about progressive relativism. Progressive relativism, which basically means that we start accepting sin little by little, incrementally. It starts creeping in uh, virtually now where we have priests at the Religious Education Congress this week and half a dozen promoting homosexuality as something normal, as something good. Okay, This is something that we wouldn't even, even talked about 10 years ago. This is called progressive relativism that Diedrich von Hilderman warned us about. And it's not even progressive now. It's in your face. Yeah, And is. that's why even Ellis von Hilderman talks about uh, in, in her edition of the book, uh, she's uh, she says uh, there's about 225 American Catholic colleges. Well, guess what? Talk about uh, progressive relativism. She says about 20, about 20 are actually Orthodox and deserve to be called Catholic. And uh, so you have to ask yourself, to what extent did Bella Dodd's seminarian recruits, whether leftist, Marxist politics and theology, you know, how much did they help to destroy our Catholic colleges? What we do know is that the left is forever sponsoring Rainbow Coalition. These include alliances of Marxists, radical feminists, homosexuals, uh, you know, minorities and malcontents of every stripes. If among the thousand seminarians recruited by Bella Dodd and possibly thousands of others recruited by other communists, there were active sexual perverts, including pedophiles, they could have been the seedbed that has sprouted into the ghastly sex scandals today plaguing the Catholic Church worldwide. And by the way, I would also maintain it's only logical that many of those uh, pedophiles and sexual per perverts were Vatican experts at Vatican II. They sat there, they call them uh, uh, paridus. Pr pr mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're theological experts. These A lot of these people were the ones that were uh, recruited by the communists, and some of these are probably the second waves of those recruited by the communists. They were malcontents. They were dissenters. And they were sitting there deciding what the church is going to teach after 1965. Mm. That's true. This progressive relativism, Jess, that's, that's huge because, um, you know, you, you see it. People, they're trying to, to destroy objective truth. And uh, when, once they they start promoting their, their agenda, they're then... To them, that's their objective truth, you know, so they try to foist that on all of us. And um, as Hildebrand put it, whether something is alive and dynamic seems more important than whether it is true and good. The substitution is a symptom of intellectual and moral decay. And he says, how, uh, this is how else can we account for the wholesale attacks on religion today in the media and academia? The assumption of progressives is that religion is not the spirit of our age, but it is the spirit of past ages. And so we must enter an age of prog progress by shedding all our religious illusions. Not only must we shed the ancient mythologies, we must also shed the moral values. Those mythologies are identified with. Uh, so this, the absurdity of this position is that progressivism dethrones objective truth while at the same time presenting itself as objective truth. And uh, he talks about uh, like abortion and homosexuality. They've come to be accepted in, in as the convenient morals of our age with the implication that this is progress. And all discussion of the merit of abortion of homosexuality is cut off, and those who protest that the discussion should continue are labeled as religious Neanderthals. What was that term that, that Hillary Clinton foisted on us at uh, during the last election? Deplorable. We, deplorable, says she go. That's right. Inherent in progressivism is something approximately approximating a religious faith that progress always improves the human condition. But no skeptics are allowed to contest whether it is true or false religious faith the prog progressives have acquired. So, And the question must be asked, has, has no progress civilization ever gone into retrograde so profound that it fell apart at the end? Ask the ancient Greeks after they have answered. Ask the Caesars of ancient Rome. Then look at the curriculum courses of your average Catholic colleges today and compare them with the, the course offerings of 60 years ago, likely will be found little of, of any study of St. Thomas, St. Augustine, but plenty of courses in the jungle of modern ethical systems. The church has been secularized, no doubt, Jess. And, uh, you know... Ruben, let me give them some ammunition. Some people that, that uh, run across people 
in the Catholic Church that use the term progressive as something positive. Yeah. As, as Von Hildebrand shows, th- there's nothing positive about... M- morality can progress. The only thing that can progress is your cell phone, your computer, your car, uh, you know, your microwave. That can progress because that's technology. Morality can't progress. It's fixed. It's immutable like God is immutable. God gave us two genders, Adam and Eve. God gave us marriage. God gave a woman the right to have a baby, the, the ability to have a baby. There are some things that you can't progress. They're fixed. It's part of the natural law. But uh, here's an ammunition for those that deal with progressives, even in your parish. The word progressive is denounced in the Bible. And I'm going to use the New American Bible. This is the one that the U.S. bishops gave us after Vatican II. So I'm going to use a translation that they gave us, okay? Because many of them are progressive. So I'm going to use a translation that they gave us okay. uh, to denounce their teachings. Second John chapter is seven to nine. Look what this says in the New American Bible. Doesn't say it in the Dewey Reams or the RSV. It's only in the Dewey in the New American Bible. Okay, the official one read in every mass throughout the country. Okay, here it says, many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh, such as the deceitful one and the Antichrist. Look to yourselves that you do not lose what we work for, but may receive a full recompense. Any verse nine. Anyone who is so progressive as not to remain in the teaching of the Christ does not have God. Stop right there. Wow. The Bible's very clear. Here's the one that the bishops gave us in Vatican II. It's right here. I haven't okay? heard that at Mass. <laughs> yeah, you haven't heard, I, I, <laughs> I haven't heard, I, that. I heard that reading at Mass. Yeah. It says it here, two things, that there are deceivers in the world that have come amongst us. Then the very next word, what does it call these deceivers? Progressives. It's in the New American Bible. 2 John verses one, chapter 1, verses 7 and 9. These deceivers that have gone out into the world that Dieter von Hildebrand is talking about, the Bible, the New American Bible calls them progressives. And what's the definition of a progressive according to the New American Bible? It says, those that do not remain in the teaching of the Christ. And those that do not remain in the teaching don't have God. Well, when Father James Martin promotes homosexuality from a pulpit, is that remaining in the teaching of the Christ? And I can give you multiple examples. These progressives are all around us, and we've got to resist them. We've got to fight against them. We've got to pray. We've got to become holy. We've got to know our faith, and we've got to live our faith and share our faith. Ruben, I'm done. <laughs> That's that right, Jess. Down. We, have to, we have to proclaim from the rooftops. We have to be the salt of the earth, the light, the light that uh, is not, and not put down. We have to shine so others can see. That uh, God is living in us. Uh, be that Amen. face of Christ to people. Holiness. That's right. Get holy or die trying. <laughs> That's right, Jess. We have uh, finished out our Lenten s- uh, seasons and stay strong, my friends. We got to uh, stick with our, our our fasts, our prayer life. Uh, just don't give up. Stay tuned for uh, Gary Mashuda and Hands-On Apologetics. We are going to uh, close this show. We're 10-7. 10, 10,